Put God first. Your presence in their lives gives them validation. Our children don't need us to be superheroes. If you do these things, the next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today. Men, stand up, be fathers. Hey guys, it's Mark, your host and founder of The Inspired Legacy. As always, this is the show that equips and inspires men just like you to unleash your inner lion and reveal your true purpose as spiritual leaders in your home. Continuing our recognition of the men and women who voluntarily put themselves in harm's way on behalf of our great nation, we're picking it up right where we left off with part two of my conversation with Major Jordan Northrup. Now, if you didn't hear part one, I would encourage you to just push the pause button now and go back and listen to that episode because it does provide a lot of context to who Jordan is and some of you know what he's been through as a Marine. But in today's episode, we're finally diving into Jordan's book titled The War Inside, which covers his 20-year struggle and ultimate victory over alcohol abuse. Now, whether you personally struggle with alcohol or not, there are lessons here that we can all learn from because whether we like to admit it, guys, we are all addicted to something, whether it's something we don't want to talk about as a society, like an addiction to porn or sex or drugs, um, things that are very prevalent in male culture today, or something that may seem insignificant, like food, uh, money, or smartphones, uh, social media, You know, all of these things can potentially have a negative impact on our lives. And Jordan outlines some really practical ways that faith can help us overcome whatever we're battling in life. So I really want you guys to dial into today's episode. Really, there's just so many great lessons here that, again, you don't have to be battling in an alcohol addiction to get something out of this. Jordan touches on the significance of knowing your identity in Christ why it's important for men to reject passivity, accept personal responsibility, to lead courageously, and invest eternally. Guys, this is really good stuff, and I hope you just share the heck out of today's episode. Help me and help Jordan get this message in front of as many men as possible. And you can do that by literally sharing this episode on social media. And when you do that, tag me. I'm at The Inspired Legacy. And tag Jordan at Jordan R. Northrup. Uh, Tag us and tell us what you thought of the episode and help us get the message out there. All right. That's probably enough for me. Guys, here's part two of my interview with Major Jordan Northrup. You never enjoy it, but you get used to it. And used to it, you get stronger and your resilience grows and builds. So by the end of, by the end of boot camp, and then extrapolate that through a combat deployment, the things that would stress you out as a civilian, as a Marine coming back from the battlefield, it's like, yeah, it's no big deal anymore. I, you know, I've like suffered worse. And you just, you can find that you can, you find that you can just endure and bear so much more than your average American can because of what you've had to go through. Well, and again, we're grateful for you guys for doing it too. I feel like I've, uh, Spent way too much time on your uh, military background. We've yet to get into the meat of our discussion here. <laughs> um, and we haven't touched on the fact that you've written a book. Yeah. I want you to tell us about this book, but I know that the book itself stems from your struggle with alcohol. Yes. And your and your, uh, your victory over alcohol. Correct. So, you know, writing a book, that's something that I would like to do someday. A lot, I think a lot of people would like to write a book. So how did you decide that this was actually something that you wanted or felt like you needed to do? What was that trigger point? Yeah. So this was a couple of years ago and I'd gotten sober. So um, in parallel to my college and my Marine Corps life, I was, I was a blackout drunk. Mm. So, you know, in the Marine Corps, you work hard and you play hard. And, uh, and we'll delve in, in, into this in like a little bit, but, uh, basically I was a blackout drunk for 14 years and finally through finding my identity in Jesus Christ, I was able to break free from that bondage. And so i have been sober for a very short time. I remember I was laying in bed one night and I was a single guy. I wasn't married yet. I was reading, I was about to go to bed 
and I was I clipped off my light, and I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, Jordan, get up and start writing down your story. And I was like, you know, I kind of had that tug at my heart, you know, like my heart began to beat a little bit faster, and I was like, nah, this is this is this isn't anything. I just rolled over, and I went to sleep. Well, the next night I had it again, and then I had it again and again. And so finally on the fourth night, I was like, all right, God, I'm going to get up and I'll start to write. So this is now, it's like one o'clock in the morning on the fourth night, and I go into my office at home, and I just turn on my computer, and I just start writing an introduction. You know, how would I want this this thing to, to, to like read? And that's what kind of began the process. And I just, I felt this burden that I had a story to share um, and I needed to tell people what, what I did. And, um, and, and I want people to feel compelled by the book because this book is unique because it's written from a unique perspective, right? So when I was trying to get sober, I had bought a whole bunch of books you know, like the self-help kind, but they always came off as very academic and impersonal, and I couldn't really relate to what I was reading, and it was kind of too cheesy and too and too scripted, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So when I nothing spoke to me to my to my core, and so as I began to write the story, I wrote it from the voice of the average guy. You know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a pastor. A theologian. I'm not a therapist. I, I don't have a license for anything. I'm just a guy who got free from alcohol by finding my identity in Jesus Christ. And so even though this book is about alcohol and victory from it, the truth is that it can be applied to any kind of an addiction because our sins, they manifest in our vices. They manifest in each one of us in a different way according to what's on the inside. But the root of it is all the same. It's that brokenness, it's that sinfulness, and that identity in the world. But the identity in Christ is the secret. And so that's why I think this book can be so compelling, because it's written in a narrative, easygoing way. And your average guy can pick it up and say, you know what, that guy's me. I know what he's going through because I'm going through like that same thing. And it's in a language that they'll get. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important that you wrote this from the perspective of, like you said, an average guy, because that's something that, again, people can relate to because you you touched on it. People, so many people don't relate to, you know, if the book is written by a doctor or some expert who has maybe not ever gone through it themselves, but are qualified, quote unquote, to treat the problem. So I think that this is an important uh, it's an important book I think more guys need to get their hands on because we all have some sort of an addiction, whether we want to admit it or not. There's the the bigger addictions like we all think of, alcoholism, uh, gambling, drugs, sex, pornography. Those are all real things and they're prevalent in male society. Yeah. But there's, not to you know belittle the term addiction, but there's other addictions as well, like addiction addicted to food. Right, addicted to TV or Netflix, and those things can be a problem in your life as well. They can have an impact in your life, yeah. Whether it's work or home life, and so I think there's something here that so many men can take something away from. I want to maybe step back in time just a little bit, without without going into too much detail. You know, you said you were a, a blackout drunk for 14 years. Yes. How did you get to that place, man? Yeah. So that's kind of that question is really really deep. And the answer to it's not a simple one. And I think to really understand the mind of an addict, you kind of have to go back to the beginning. And so, you know, from my childhood, I came from a broken home and I had a stutter. And I grew up feeling, you know, very different from the average kids. I felt kind of defective. And I got on into high school, I wasn't popular, I was a big nerd, didn't play sports, never had a girlfriend. Nobody wanted to be my friend. And so I go through high school kind of thinking that I'm just I'm just different. I'm just not I'm just not good. I'm not worth anything. And when I got to college, I was like, this is gonna be my time. I'm gonna break out. I'm gonna I'm gonna become a person now. And so I found that when I got to college, I was 21. I never really drank before. But I was able to buy alcohol for minors on campus because I went to I went to a Christian school in Michigan. I was able to buy uh, like alcohol for minors, and I quickly joined the underground like party scene. Yeah, 
And that was a way for acceptance because people needed me for something, albeit the wrong thing. Yeah, you were probably a pretty popular guy at that point. Right. I was, I was, my name was like, I was the guy who buys. And there was no questions asked. I was going to hook you up because I needed you to need me. Right. And so, you know, that, you know, after, you know, I got on into my senior, my junior, my senior year of college, that wasn't a thing anymore because everybody was like 21 at that point. But then I transitioned to the Marine Corps and in the Marine Corps, you work hard and you play hard. And so, you know, the weeks were spent training and working and doing my thing, but the weekends was my time. And that's when I would kind of, to kind of unwind and always being an introvert, I would want to be kind of alone, do my own thing. And I would just drink all, all weekend long. Mm. And so little bit by like little bit, one bad choice after another, you need more and more booze to kind of get that feeling. Um, it all kind of came to, it just, just kept increasing. And, you know, I lost a number of, uh, of relationships because of, um, booze. And finally, uh, let's come up to 2012. This is, I was binge drinking at this point where I would binge drink for three to four to three to four days straight. Wow. And I'm, I'm talking like constant, you know, I would drink till I would pass out. I'd wake up whatever time of day or night it was. And I would just drink again till I would pass out again. And this would go on for three or four days until I just had to go to bed and then, you know, get back to work. And so, um, in January of 2012, my father came to visit me here in Virginia for a week. And after he left, I went right to the liquor store and I stocked up, man. I mean, I got beer, I got liquor, I got wine, I got some champagne, I got cigarettes, I got snacks. And I came back because I had three days before I had to go back to work. And I just, I just jumped right in. And so in three days I put away, let me see here, four packs of cigarettes, like two pizzas, um, a bottle of champagne, three bottles of wine, and about and about fifty beers. Wow! In a three day stretch, so you can just imagine what the end. I remember that last night, I my body was shutting down, my heart was like shaking, it was palpitating. I had cold sweats, my hands were shaking so bad because I had really overstepped my coverage at this point. Mm-hmm. I remember I was laying in bed. It was a Tuesday night, and I was like, "God, please don't let me die tonight," because I, I've 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 drank myself to death. And and he didn't. And I woke up and I kind of fell into this like fitful sleep. And I woke up on Wednesday morning, and I, as I was getting ready for work, my hands were shaking so bad that I couldn't even shave. But that was at the point where I was broken enough that I was ready to admit that I had a problem and that I needed God's help. Man. Yeah, that's, uh, that's in a low spot, man. I got to think that you were not necessarily in Marine shape at that point in time. No, I mean I, I was not. I was I was overweight. Um, I didn't have the physical like stamina to jog around a track. You know, I, I I could lift weight, but not very well. You know, I was I was always out of breath. Just it just I felt horrible physically all the time because I was just so you know soaked up with booze. Even on days where I wasn't drinking, I was detoxing from the weekend before. Sure. Yeah just always exhausted because I just wouldn't get any sleep. So my health was really deteriorating. So you, uh, you mentioned praying to God. At what point did you become a believer? Yeah. So, um, so I was saved as, as a child. Um, fortunately I was born to, uh, to Christian parents and we were always in church from the earliest, uh, age. And so, you know, I grew up, uh, going to, uh, Sunday school, I knew all the stories, went to Awana, I went to Christian schools, like high school and things. So um got saved when I was seven years old. I rededicated my life when I was a teenager. Uh, I think I was 14 or so. But um, I would say that because of all the crisis of identity as I was growing up, faith was there, but it wasn't really real to me, if that makes sense. I didn't really mm-hmm. use it. It wasn't it was it was more academic to me. It was more just um, something that I did. It wasn't really who I was. And so, and then when I joined uh, uh, the core, you know, um, I definitely deepened my faith in times of crisis, like a like a combat deployment. Sure. But again, it wasn't really very real to me in the sense that it is now. And so, 
I would say that after that moment where I had my big binge uh, in January of 2012, that was a real turning point where I realized that you know faith needs to become more of a part of who I am um, if it's if I'm going to get some uh, victory over my uh, drinking addiction. Jordan, I want to go back to you know you, you told us about your big binge episode in 2012, kind of hitting rock bottom. You know, you're obviously sober now. So talk us through like, how did you work your way through sobriety? Because I know that looks different for a lot of people. And for some people, it takes years. So just kind of talk us through like, how did you actually become sober? How did you beat alcohol? Sure. So uh, Mark, that question's really, really good. And again, it's a very, it's a very deep kind of an uh, answer. One that I think a lot of your uh listeners can relate to. So we talked a little bit about that big binge of where in those three days in January of 2012, where I put away four packs of cigarettes, uh, a bottle of champagne, three bottles of wine, and about 50 or so beers all in a a two-day stretch. Well, following that binge, I, I I, I, I was fully ready to admit that I had a problem, that I needed to turn to the Lord for my deliverance. And so um, that Friday, I knew it was going to be difficult because every Friday begins the weekend. And for the last 10 like years, what I would do was I would leave base and I would stop at the liquor store and I would stock up. So I kept praying and praying that the Lord would give me the strength to uh, withstand that temptation to by alcohol. And so by his grace, that Friday, I went home and I didn't buy any booze. So I made it through that night and into that next uh, day. And that kicked off about a three month period of sobriety for me. And, you know, like we do so many times, I was emotionally, I was riding really high, but I found a way to mess it all up. <laughs> <laughs> and because right when I was getting really, you know, strong and confident and cocky, if like you will, I decided to get back into the dating game. And so I met a girl at my church, um, and she was uh, she was a veteran herself, and we kind of clicked, and we went on a couple of dates, and she was a believer, I was a believer, and uh, she was leading a woman's Bible study group, and everything was just kind of moving right along. And I really thought that God had brought her into my life and this was going to be, you know, a victory for me. And so, because coming off of this binge in in alcohol, this 14 year, this, at this time, it was like a 12 year fight. I I needed kind of a victory, right? In like my life. And I really thought that this girl was going to be that victory. And um, a couple months into our relationship, I kind of noticed that she, you know, drank, wine with meals and she'd have a beer occasionally and she never pressured me to drink myself because i was being so i was being like a sober guy yeah kind of began to question like well hey you know why don't you want to have a glass of wine with me or you know a glass of champagne or a beer i'm like well you know because i and i kind of told her my history and you know in a certain way i didn't want to scare her off and she would you know would hold my hand at my hand in the right places and give me encouragement and um But I began to notice that she really kind of had a pattern of social uh, drinking. Well, about three, three and a half months into our relationship, she was out of town visiting some family back west, and uh, I was alone. And so I found myself uh, doing some errands that afternoon, and all of a sudden this craving just came out of nowhere. And if you get it, if you and if your listeners can can identify with this, when you get a craving, at least for me, it would kind of begin like like claws right in the back of your head, and they would just dig in and dig in and get louder and louder, and that grip would be tighter until the point where it's like screaming into your brain, and the only way to silent to hear like nothing is to succumb to your vice. Mm. And before you knew it, I I found myself walking out of the liquor store with a bottle of scotch and a six pack of beer. And before I even knew what had happened, I had gone home and I had popped the beers and I was drinking the beers as I was cleaning my my apartment. And I woke up at three o'clock that morning, that next like my morning in my bathtub with the shower curtain pulled down over top of me. I was covered in vomit. Wow. And uh and the, the faucet was drip, drip, dripping, you know, you know, on me. And I'm like, how in that and I was like, how in the heck did I get here? 
and I, as I was coming to through my stupor, I kind of put it together. I drank all that booze, and I passed out in my tub. I have no idea how, how I actually got there. So I cleaned myself off, and I went to bed. Well, the next morning, I was so mad at myself, I was disgusted. I mean, here I had I'd given up you know, three, three and a half months of sobriety for what, a bottle of uh, scotch and a hangover? I mean, I hated myself for doing that. And I vowed that I would never really get drunk again. And I kind of lived on that resolve for a couple of weeks to a month. But like anything, you when you, and you submerge and suppress a part of yourself, you have to come up for air eventually. Mm-hmm. And so I began to take little you know, you know, drinks here and there, you know, a couple of drinks here with her, maybe, you know, a six pack here, or if she was out of town, I would sneak a little bit more booze. And and this kind of became more of a pattern where I would, you know, abstain for a period of time, but then I would like overindulge. And I kind of, you know, told myself that, well, you're, you're sober for the most part, you know, not, but not totally. So I was trying to rationalize that away. Well, um, that summer we decided to get engaged. And so I proposed and she said yes. And, um, and moving into that fall, she, um, she had a business trip where she had to go to England for three months because she was working for the, uh, intelligence community at the time. And she needed to go over there to, to uh, England to do some work. And so basically she was gone for, you know, three months from that September to uh, basically end of November. And we had a wedding date planned for that December. And the whole time she was gone on the weekends, I was just getting hammered, hammered. I had lost any willpower that I had left. And I figured, you know, I can always clean up when she comes back because marriage will save me. Yeah. Right. Because I was like, well, you know, if I'm married, if I have a wife at home, I'm certainly not going to be getting drunk all like the time. And that's the lie that I told myself. And so every weekend I would just drink from Friday afternoon till Sunday night and and, and sometimes even through the night and into the next morning. So you can just imagine the kind of toll that was taking on like my body. And even when I was going into work in uniform like that, I mean, it was taking some serious like risks. And fortunately, I never kind of got caught by my uh, superior officers, but they could tell that there was something wrong. And so, um, so uh, my fiance came back from England in uh, November, at the end of November, we got married in December, and we moved in together to begin our life. And so this would be um, <clears throat> like the first part of 2013. And Things were not just going, they were just not going well. And I had a hard time connecting to her emotionally. What seemed so easy the year before, and our relationship now is just so foreign to me. And alcohol kept clouding my mind on the weekends. I would just kind of want to retreat and unwind and kind of drink and drink to excess and stay up during the night and drink through the night. And she wanted to have a husband, you know, to to be a partner with. And I really wasn't interested in that. I was interested in being drunk. And so she Mm. would, you know, retreat into her friendships and we just couldn't talk to each other. And this went on for the better part of, you know, I would say 13 to 14 months and things just kept getting worse and worse and worse until finally one day, um, and I want to say it was February of 2014, I came home from work and found her sitting on the couch and she was crying to herself. I'm like, Hey, you know, Hey babe, what's like going on? I didn't really care, but I kind of did, but I kind of didn't. And she just looked at me with this, like, you know, crushed look in her eyes, this look of defeat. And she's like, we have to talk tonight. Now I, now I'm, I know what the talk means, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so we, every out, guy knows what those words mean. <laughs> right. So we went out to dinner that night. I, I think she wanted to stay home, but I just, I kind of wanted to have some, something of a distraction while we talked. So I figured if we went out to a meal, we could kind of have that. So we get out to this restaurant we sit down and we order, and after the order's been taken, and now we just have to look at each other. And uh, she ta- she tells me that uh, she doesn't love me, and she's not sure that she ever did, and she wants to get a divorce. 
Man. And uh, and I sit there and I'm just kind of, I'm kind of taken aback and I you know I don't really know how to process that and it hurt hearing those words hurt. You didn't see it coming at all. I I, I kind of did see it coming, but to hear her say that yeah was kind of like just a punch in the face. And the tr- to be truthful, it hurt, but I was kind of relieved in a certain sense because I knew that the way we were going wasn't sustainable. And I'd wondered myself over the past year if we had made a mistake in getting married to begin with. And I was the selfish part of me was like, well, she's offering you a free get out of out of jail free card here. But then the Christian part of me was like, are you really going to walk on your marriage? Like, seriously? Yeah. And so I'm trying to have this like these this kind of dichotomy, you know, yes or no. I'm wrestling with this, but her mind's made up. And so I think that that experience really opened my heart to something else. And I reached out to a the counseling center at my church and I reached out and I said, "Hey, this is my situation. I am an absolute drunk. I was sober for a little bit. I've relapsed for the last 2 years. Basically, I've been a drunk for 14 years. My marriage is about to die. I need some help." And so the counseling center, they hooked me up with a guy named Don who who had some skill in this. Now let me tell you about Don. So he was a Navy guy and he was retired and he had this kind of ministry where he had uh, experience working with uh, men's addictions. He'd worked in some halfway uh, houses before. He'd worked with guys that were hooked on heroin and cocaine and crack and alcohol. And so, I mean, he, he knew, he knew how to deal with these kind of things. And we began to develop a counseling relationship and I would go every Saturday for two hours, I would pay for two hours of his time, and he would counsel me. He was like my therapist. And this is this is after she had asked for the divorce, and so I'm just trying to do anything that I can to save my marriage at this point. And if I could get like sober too, that would be a bonus. And so the way he counseled was he kind of counseled me not from not practical things. He didn't say like, well, Jordan, if you just step down your drinking, things will change. You know, if you try to have half as much beer, or if you try to hide your car keys or hide your wallet or, you know, do these tangible things. If you go to this many AA meetings a week, then, you know, you'll be okay. If you just do this process, then, you know, the magic will kick in. You'll be okay. He, he didn't do that. He, he counseled me and he asked me, what is your motivations of your heart? And, and I never heard those kinds of questions before. And he showed me that um, he basically shone a spotlight right in my soul on the brokenness in my life and how I built this broken identity around being a loser in school and being a stutterer and being mm-hmm. unpopular and having a broken home and not having success at college and all these like failures that I just reinforced to myself. But I believed that I was just a loser. And all these things had led me to find, you know, some way to cope and to hide the pain and deal with the pain. And now I just went into drinking. And that's why I became this blackout drunk for the past 14 years. So he helped me like see that it's that what I'm doing, my drinking, is because of the brokenness, not because I have an alcoholic gene or a disease or some weird DNA that just makes me drink that absolves me of responsibility. He's like, you're all responsible, but you have to understand what's causing it and knows that brokenness. And and then there was one day, there was one day where he where we're sitting in his office, you know, him, me on the couch, him in his chair, and he leans forward in his chair and he, he said, he asked, he beckons me, he said, Jordan, why don't you come here? And he he asked me to lean in. And he looked me right in the face. And he goes, who are you? And I just, I just looked at him and I had no idea what to say. I, I just, I hadn't, I did not know what to say at all. And I kind of sat back on the couch and just looked at him and he goes, who are you? And then he goes, are you a Marine? Are you a husband? Are you a failure? Are you a drunk? And the answer was, I was all of those things. Mm-hmm. But 
he what then then he asked me the question. He goes, "Now, who are you in Christ, and who are you to Christ?" And as we began to unpack those last two questions, he showed me how to reform an identity, not based on my stutter, not based on a failing marriage, not based on 14 years of drunkenness, but an identity based on Jesus Christ and him alone. And as I began to align who I was towards Jesus, ironically, I began to drink less and less and less. And the heart towards my wife began to get stronger. And I could see where I'd been hurting her and my lack of being a man and lack of being a husband and not giving her what she needed. It began to really convict me and I really began to try to fight hard for my marriage. And so this kind of went on for about two more months. And I remember I woke up, it was um, April the 19th of 2014. And it was a Monday morning and it was a beautiful day. It was warm. And as I got ready for work that day, I just, I knew something I just knew that I was going to be sober from there on out. And so that Friday, that Saturday, that next like week, when I got back to the office, Don was like, Hey, are you sober? I'm like, I'm sober. He's like, praise God. One, one more week down. And we kept talking about that. I talked to him about that day and how it felt different. How I really felt that the Lord was coming along the side of me and giving me the power not because of some lightning bolt that he shot down from heaven to transform me into a sober guy. No, I I wasn't going to get that. It was going to be, but I went back to him every day for grace and sustainment. And uh, we talked about like living in the spirit. And to me, that was trusting Jesus to give me the emotional endurance for one more day to not get drunk. And then Mm. I kept working that and working that. And, um, lo and behold, you know, one month turned into two months and three months became six and six months turned into a year. And then a year became two and two became four and four became six. And my sobriety continues to this day. And so that's how I became sober. Man, that is powerful. And you basically laid out the playbook, I think for a lot of guys who we, we hear that that phrase, finding power in Christ, lean into Christ. And a lot of guys just don't know what that means or what it looks like, practically speaking. And I think you did a good job of laying that out. I do want to hit one more point. So what's interesting is even though I was getting sober, you would think that my marriage would heal itself, but it didn't. Okay, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, because as I became closer to the Lord and my life was cleaning up, my wife was getting angrier and angrier because remember she, she was a drinker herself. And now that I'm kind of walking straight in the narrow, she has nothing more to complain against. You know, she can't say, well, I'm doing what I'm doing because you're doing what you're doing. Now I'm not doing anything wrong, but yet she's doing all, all of these things. And so through that spring and the summer of 2014, as I'm trying to rebuild my marriage and I have these initial few months of sobriety, she's going off, off of the deep end. Um, she would get drunk all, all the time and she would actually bring guys home to our house because I had moved into the guest room oh, Wow! and she would have guys in our bedroom throughout the weekend because in her mind she was separated and she wasn't tied to me. Anymore. Wow, man. So here I am trying to rebuild with a woman who's bringing men home from the bar on Saturday night. And so but I kept trying to love her, but but what happened was she just became more and more like reckless and determined to uh sell to self-destruct and she eventually she moved out in um September of that year and because she didn't want to be faced with the visual of her consequences anymore. She didn't want to have to, she couldn't justify doing what she was doing while I wasn't partaking, if you like, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And so um, she moved out in that, that fall and our divorce was finalized in uh, January of 2015. And the last time I saw her, she came by to drop off the keys to a car that we owned together and she told me that she was um, 
resigning her job. She was turning in her clearance and she was leaving the country and she wasn't coming back. She said that she thought God was a myth, that nobody was on the other end listening to her prayers. And she wasn't going to waste one more minute of her life uh, trying to find this um, this uh, fake God or live with a guy like me who was, um, you know, a, a hypocrite. So she was done. That was the last time that I, I ever saw saw her in person. Wow. Okay. I think that's a great example. I mean, I don't want to make too many assumptions here, but it's, she was obviously going through her own spiritual battles. Yes. As you were recovering, she was stumbling and Satan saw that as an opportunity yep. and he took advantage. He did. He did. You know, and the way, and you would think that sometimes with that much trauma in your relational life, that maybe I would turn back to alcohol to kind of cope and to kind of soothe some of the pain. But at this point, I'd almost had nine months of sobriety and I was so ingrained in pursuing Christ and having my identity in him that the thought of going back to alcohol didn't even cross my mind. And that's the Holy Spirit working. Right. Instead, what I do is I would surround myself with Christian guys from my church mm -hmm. who would pour into me and talk to me and pray with me. You know, I would I'd be on the I'd be on the phone to my counselor. I st I kept seeing Don on the weekends, and I just made sure I did not have one idle moment to myself. If I wasn't at the office, I was at the gym. I was you know playing golf. I was on my therapist's couch. I was volunteering at my church. I made sure I had not one idle, idle like moment where the devil could jump in there and cause me to me to uh, stumble. Well, I think that's a good tactic. Practically speaking, you know, like you said, as long as our minds are occupied, yeah, when, you, when you've got something to focus on, uh, that's a good tool to kind of keep in your toolbox. Yep. And I love the, the accountability factor in all this too. Obviously, you know, reinventing your your self image through the lens of who you are in Christ and who you are to Christ is key. What we can do here on earth is, like you said, surround ourselves with guys who are not afraid to ho hold our feet to the fire and hold us accountable for our actions. So that's right. really good. Yep. Well, man, we just we breeze through uh, quite a journey there. And so, remind me again, how many years sober are you now? Um, six. Six years. Congrats, man. That's awesome. So obviously, your faith played a, a huge role in your sobriety. Uh, your victory over alcohol. So now that you, you're sober for six years, you're obviously a man of faith. How has your faith helped you kind of carve your path and purpose today? Not only as a man, but as a husband and as a father and even a Marine for that matter. Sure. So um, like I was saying, so I was, I remarried uh, about four years ago, shortly after my divorce was finalized, I met a girl at my church and um, we began to date and one thing led to another and she was everything that my first wife was not. And so um, she was accepting of who I was and she, she accepted my previous life for like what it was. I mean, we just began building a dating relationship based on Christ. And uh, about 18 months after that, we were married. And so now as a man and a husband, and I'm the father of a two-year-old boy, and even as like a Marine, I think my faith is integrated into everything that I do, into whatever role that I'm living or doing, it's, it's a part of it. So whether I'm in uniform or I'm negotiating a real estate deal or I'm leading our family and prayer at the table, um, faith is so ingrained in what I do because it's a part of who I am. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there's a pastor and an author named Clayton King. And he was speaking at our church a couple of months ago, and he gave this quote from the pulpit that just knocked me right between the eyes. And he said, when you know who you are, you'll know what to do. Oh, that's good. When you know who, when you, know who you are, you'll know what to do. Now let's, look at, now, let's tie this back to what my counselor, Don, was teaching me about, about who, who are you in Christ and who are you to Christ. When I when we reform our identities based around Jesus Christ, we know who we are. You know, there's some parts 
you can look through the New Testament and all these declarations, you know, I am a child of God. You know, in Christ, I am a new, be- I have a new beginning. In Christ, I have more than overcome. You know, in Christ, I am a new creation. Uh, in Christ, I am a citizen of heaven. All these declarations that we have because we have saving faith in Jesus Christ comes a part of who you are. And so when, you, when you've been able to answer that question, who am I? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, a Marine, and I'm a husband, and I'm a father, and I'm a former drunk, and I do all these things, and we have all these facets of who we are as, as people. But if you ask, who are you? I'm a child of Jesus Christ. And so when you, ha- when you know that, when you can answer that with confidence and power, knowing who you are, then you'll know what to do. Because when you are a child of, of, of Christ, you're not going to do certain things because because you just won't. So as that plays out in how I, you know, and I go about my day and how I work out and how I deal with people at my office and how I command the Marines that are under my charge and how I talk to my wife and how I treat her and, uh, and how I raise my son and all these little things. I just integrate Jesus into all parts of it. Now, that doesn't mean that I have to go crazy or, or, or act all weird, but it's just it's just part of who I am. I'm not, I'm not going to say certain things. I'll have a softer t- tone of voice. You know, I'll be gentle and kind and self with like self control and bring peace along with with me where wherever I go. Uh, actually, last night I was at a, a Bible study at my church, and there and there was this question asked. Do you, does peace enter the room alongside of you? That was a great like, like question. So as it relates back to, to the faith, it just integrates into, into everything that I do. Do you mean like uh, when peace, does peace enter the room with you, like in terms of like the vibe you put off? Right. It's like when you enter a room, do you come in with tension, with turmoil, with yeah. anger, with you know, sarcasm, or do you come in, or, or does peace come along with you in the, this like calming effect, right? Yeah, yeah. Because, because peace is one of the fr- fr- fruits of the Spirit. So, um, and again, it all is possible because we can answer that question, who, who like, am I? Well, first of all, there are definitely those people who, who don't bring peace with them into the room. But that's an interesting point you brought up about, again, we keep going back to um, who you are in Christ. And when you like you said, when you reinvent yourself through the lens of of uh, being a child of God, being a child of Christ, everything else should become secondary, right? Like I know that as men, we get really wrapped up in our titles. Like we climb the corporate ladder to get that certain job at that corner window office. And a lot of guys put too much of their identity into that role or that title. Even when it comes to marriage and father, I know that it's really easy to blur those lines because a lot of parents their their entire lives revolve around their kids and it's really easy to replace god who should be on the throne with either your spouse or your child and obviously our families are, are important but they shouldn't come before god yep and so that's it's hard to do sometimes but i it's a very very key point you just made jordan i know that you're commanding men and you've got a lot of experience and you've got um sort of a platform so to speak nowadays and you know what? I'm a horrible host. I didn't even mention the name of your book. Guys, the the book that we've been kind of talking about here is called The War Inside. And so with this platform that you've developed with this book, I know you do a lot of speaking. You know, what is your message to men today as you go out in the world? Yeah. So, you know, um, I've had the opportunity to, to command a lot of uh, guys. And, and aside from the military, I've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of men's addiction groups and things like that. And, you know, I've come across men who are passive or they're apathetic. Um, They struggle with um, some kind of substance abuse, or it could be a gambling addiction or just something, or they're just lacking purpose and passion and drive. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's four things that I, that I, that I would like to hit. And I, I pulled those four things from a series that my Bible study and I did a couple of years ago called The Authentic Man. And there's four things that authentic men do. One is reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously, and invest eternally. Mm. Okay, so just real quick, what do those four things actually mean? So when we say passive, 
we, I mean, you know, it's passive is taking the path of least resistance, right? It's sitting on the couch, watching TV instead of leaning into your children. Yep. It, it's not pouring into your wife's heart because you'd rather be doing something else for yourself. It's um, not taking the initiative. It's not, it's not being intentional. So I think the society of today really encourages mask. It, it, it discourages masculinity and kind of props up this redefined identity of what a man is supposed to be, a, you know, more of a softer kind of a, you know, gender fluid, not really firm or strong or, and that's just the narrative that we have today. And it's just false. It's just false. And so we reject that uh, sense of being passive. And then accepting responsibility goes back to that ownership that we talked about uh, in part one, yeah. right? You own that. Accept the responsibility. You are a man called by God to lead your family in the best way that you can. And and as men and as husbands and dads, we're going to have to give an account one day when we stand before the Lord. We're going to have to explain why we did or didn't do certain things uh, with the with the uh, the roles that He has a has a given us. And then you can lead courageously and without fear. There, there's times where, you know, as a Marine, I don't know if I didn't know if I was making the right call, whether it's on a convoy in battle or, you know, a, a certain administrative thing or as, as a husband or a dad. I mean, I have fears just like everybody else. I don't know if everything that I'm doing is you know, quote unquote, the right thing to do, but I'm following my conscience. I'm trusting in the Lord for his, for his like wisdom. And I'm leading my family with as much courage and strength, strength as I possibly can. And then investing eternally. So Mark, kind of like what you were just talking about a second ago, you talked about how as men, we can hide behind titles or we're trying to climb that corporate ladder, or we're trying to you know, build up the bank account or have the nice car in the driveway or, or all these things that we chase and things that are temporal that only last here here on planet Earth or, you know, they're, they're just finite. And we don't have how little do we think about what we're storing up for ourselves in eternity. I mean, we're only here on this Earth for, uh, you know, you know, decades. Our life is a vapor and it's over. Mm-hmm. And for our 80 or 90 like years compared to the vastness of eternity is nothing. And how little do we think about what's waiting on the other side of that curtain of death? Right? Yeah, absolutely. So why not invest eternally, invest in things that matter, invest in, invest in Christ, pour Christ into your children, into your wife, store up a treasure for yourself in heaven that you'll have forever and ever, not a temporal thing. So, you know, as so those four things I think are crucial, crucial for men. And one more thing, so I'm part of also part of a, a a business group, a mastermind, if like you will. And um we meet several t- times a year, and we met this last time in February of this year. And one of the guys gave, um, he was giving a workshop during that, during that weekend, and he said something that I thought was just profound. It was a quote by um, John Eldridge, the guy who wrote um, Oh yeah, Held at Heart. Yep. And the quote is, find like-minded kings and sign alliances. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is powerful. So I mean, find like-minded men, men who are kings of their world, kings of their family, who, 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 are, who are honoring the Lord, honoring themselves, their families, who, who have a vision, who are leading their families towards that vision, be it in business and faith and the family. Find guys that are like that and sign alliances with them. And help each other along the way and kind of push each other and encourage each other towards those goals. And if men today can do that, they, you will be, they will be amazed at what they can accomplish. 100%. And that just speaks to the heart of what men need and what we're created for, and that's brotherhood. Yep. We, we need that those like-minded men, like you talked about, who are going to hold our feet to the fire. We talked about accountability a second ago. It's so key. And not just personal growth, but our spiritual growth as well. 
Well, Jordan, uh, besides, you know, being a full-time Marine, we kind of touched on a couple things. You mentioned you're in a mastermind, a business mastermind group. And I think I heard you mentioned, uh, re- doing a real estate deal earlier. What are you up to outside of being a Marine? So I'm an entrepreneur as well as being a full-time guy. Um, I am a real estate investor. So, uh, I buy houses, I fix them up and I rent them out. That's, um, kind of what I plan to do after retirement from the Marine Corps. Um, Additionally, I'm an author. I've written the book, The War Inside, Finding Victory Over Alcohol. And so I'm really praying that the Lord helps me develop that into a ministry where I can reach more and more guys with with, uh, not only like the gospel, but just the, the victory is possible. And so I speak uh, quite often with every, ch- every ch- chance that I get, um, getting in front of guys in any kind of an audience, be it a church or a school or a civic group or an addiction recovery. So the Lord is uh, blessing that endeavor as well. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what I do. That's awesome, man. Well, you've got the gift. I mean, you were just preaching there for a minute and I was just soaking it all in. Thank you. Jordan, as we wrap up here, one question I'd like to ask all of my guests, you've certainly created your own legacy here with not only your book, but just the life that you've led and the the victories that you've attained in life, not only as a Marine, uh, but as a man of Christ, a man of God and your victory over alcohol. And that'll all be part of your legacy. But when we, when we talk about legacy, what does it mean to you when you hear the phrase an inspired legacy? So if you were to leave an inspired legacy, what does that mean to Jordan Northrup? An inspired legacy to me is leaving a legacy that people are going to remember. That, you know, one day I'm not going to be here. And it's easy to be forgotten once you're no longer here. So I want to live my way or my life in such a way that is honoring to the Lord, that impacts the lives of, of people here that impacts my my family, that I will be remembered when I'm gone, um, not for you know the, the things that I've accomplished, but for who I was, the character that I have, that uh, the people after me would want to aspire to. I love it, man. I love it. Jordan, you've got an amazing story. Your uh, ministry that you're building up here is phenomenal. Where can people follow you online and learn more about what you're doing and, and what you've got going on? You can go to my website, www.jordanrnorthrop.com. Uh, I'm also on Instagram at Jordan R. Northrup as well, and on a, uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter as well. And you can find the book. Uh, it's available on like, Amazon. Awesome. Well, we're going to link to the book on the, in the show notes of this episode. Again, the title of the book is called The War Inside by Jordan Northrup. We're going to link to all of your social profiles on the, in the show notes of this episode. Jordan, I cannot thank you enough for your time. This is my first two-parter, so this is exciting for me. And again, it's exciting and an honor and a privilege to, to be talking to you um, with just all the love and respect I have for not just the Marines, but the entire U.S. military. So again, thank you for your service. Thank you for your time today. You're welcome, Mark. I, I had a blast. Man, such good stuff. I want to thank Jordan again for coming on the show. You heard him reference John Eldridge there with the quote, find like-minded kings and sign alliances. So I want to challenge you to do that. If you haven't already joined the Inspired Legacy private Facebook group, you need to do that right now. It's a men of group of men, rather, who share faith in Christ and are eager to sharpen one another, lift each other up, and just battle life together when anyone in the group needs help or held accountable. It's that quote-unquote alliance that Jordan mentioned. And men, one last time, if you got anything out of today's message, remember to subscribe, leave a five-star review, and share our message. Because when we work together to lift up fatherhood, we're going to change the world one dad at a time. Until next time, Live Inspired.